Welcome to Wholesale Change, the webcast and podcast from Distribution Strategy Group, where we offer thought leadership for wholesale change agents. And if you're on this call, you're probably a wholesale change agent. My name is Ian Heller, and I'll be hosting today along with my good friend, the master forecaster, the doctor of distribution, Jonathan Bind, PhD. Good morning, Jonathan. Hey, Ian, what's going on? Things are good. How are you today? I'm on this side of the lawn. That's a good start. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're coming to you from beautiful Colorado, and today's topic is the future of value added services. So let's jump right in, shall we? Let's do it. Okay, so I think, you know, why services, why are they becoming more important? Well, you know, one thing is that you know, it's our belief anyway that the simpler transactions are going to increasingly go to marketplaces. So you're going to see Amazon Business and Walmart.com and eBay and Alibaba and Google Shopping, et cetera, really soak up a lot of those small transactions that are, you know, not always a lot of distributors volume, but, you know, I would say, Jonathan, would you agree that they're disproportionately profitable both because the margins tend to be higher and the service costs are lower? 100%. Um, and I, I would say more broadly, if you're, if you're looking at something that's, that's MRO that can be delivered common carrier, um, that's the class of things that is vulnerable to going to, to marketplaces. Yeah. Yeah, and also uh, suppliers are distributing more directly. I mean, some of this is that, you know, the logistics capabilities have gotten so much more accessible across the world. And, you know, Amazon buying, I think they're buying like 150,000 uh, delivery vehicles over the next few years. And you already see them. They're ubiquitous in neighborhoods. Um, what's that, what that's done is that's driven down cost and increased competition in delivery. So it's easier now for manufacturers and everyone else to access these delivery capabilities. And plus, frankly, you know, for years, distributors have sort of been training their manufacturers to become distributors, right? So, I mean, how many times in corporate meetings have I heard someone say, well, you know, we only carry 500 SKUs from Acme Manufacturing, but they're shipping the rest directly for us. Well, once you stop holding inventory and stop doing delivery and processing orders, I mean, you're not adding nearly as much value as a distributor. Uh, and so I see more manufacturers shipping directly. Do you think that's gonna grow, Jonathan? Absolutely, and it's, it's, it's constant or consistent with the patterns that we're seeing in our research of manufacturers starting to sell directly uh, via e-commerce. We, we've been asking that question for the last three years in our state of e-commerce survey, and each year the, the percentage who are doing some more or a lot is growing. Right, you can get that research. Today it's on realresultsmarketing.com, but we're actually renaming that company Distribution Strategy Group. So all that research will be available on distributionstrategy.com shortly. Um, and also there's increasing 3D printing or what some people call additive manufacturing. Now, this is going to transform manufacturing, but it's also going to transform distribution uh, and retail to some degree, because a lot of items that currently are made in, you know, large factories and then shipped via supply chains to distributors and then customers are going to be made locally. I mean, either by local manufacturers that are so close to the customer that the customer is just going to order it and pick it up, or the customer is going to make those products themselves, uh, particularly as 3D printing becomes more sophisticated. And uh, some of you know, we're doing a series for the National Association of Wholesalers it's a seven part series that Jonathan and I are co-researching and co-authoring. And we're exploring a bunch of different technologies that are transforming distribution. And uh, one of them is 3D printing. So keep your eye out for that series. The first white paper starts in July. Uh, we've had a lot of interest already. So we're excited to do those white papers and webinars along with the NAW. And, and so our message is, look, so services are important for differentiation because a lot of the things that distributors did to differentiate in the past are becoming commoditized. And one of those things is uh, being able to get products to customers quickly and conveniently and based out of a wide assortment of inventory, uh, a lot of it on hand. And that's just not as differentiated anymore. I mean, you can pretty much find anything anywhere. So if you want to differentiate in the future, our belief is you're going to need to add more services. Now, among the problems with services is that distributors don't really 
prove the value or establish the value or communicate the value very well. You know, so for example, uh, one of the things I've noticed is that a lot of distributors have services, but there's no services tab on their website. You know, so you, they're hard to find and they're not well described. Uh, they don't really understand the cost of the service and there's no attempt to monetize them. And the selection of services they offer is sort of aggregated and, and it's, it's developed over the years. Um, I think you, you talked about like, it's because they have, in some, one case, you know someone who offered a service because they just had someone on staff who knew how to do the work. Is that right, Jonathan? Yeah, they, they've got a, a gal or a, a guy who knows how to do X, and they say, great, let's offer a service around X. Yeah. Well, first thing is they, they, they haven't figured out how to clone this person. So if they look at their other branch locations, they have a hard time rolling it out to the other services. Um, second, they haven't thought about monetizing it. In this particular case, the, the example that, in, that inspired this, uh, they're actually giving the service away, and it's, it's, it's quite a high-value service. So I think it, it points to your idea that, this, that you have here on the slide that distributors often, um, overwhelmingly, I would say, don't understand the value of quote-unquote value-added services. Yeah. Yeah, so we say, look, you should try to make services a profit center. You know, have someone come in who's the general manager of your services. That person may actually come out of manufacturing where they know how to do product development. And many of those principles apply to service development. Uh, but if you're not requiring uh, fees for your services, you're probably not putting a lot of rigor into controlling costs and the quality of the service and you know the measurement of it. Uh, but if you if you set it up as a profit center, it may take you a long time to actually generate a profit, but at least you'll start putting the right rigor and processes in place to move in that direction. Make sure you're doing it consistently, uh, managing the cost, identifying the cost, so you actually know what you're spending on it, over time, hopefully pulling that service away from the product itself uh, so that you aren't bundling so much. And there are a variety of reasons to do that, but we'll move on for now. Go ahead, Jonathan. Yeah, so we've looked at uh, a lot of different services. In fact, uh, by the way, we're uh, putting together a consulting offering to help distributors formulate service strategy. Um, but when we look at the categories of services, we, we break them broadly into three areas. And then, you know, sort of next level down is shown here as well. So there are logistic services, and many distributors are offering something around um, some kind of inventory, vending, bin replenishment, uh, kitting, or labeling. Um, there is another category of services that really relate to information, and this could be a pre- or a post-sale setting. So pre-sale you're looking at things like design and configuration. How do we how do we figure out the elements that we want in this product? Um, and actually, we talked to an e-commerce platform vendor yesterday who's who's offering design and configuration tools from the distributor as opposed to from the manufacturer. So you know that type of a forum is a great place for distributors to add value through information. But there are other things in the information category of services. Um, related to getting the right product, right? The, the, the joke about when you call some large distributors is that they answer the phone and they say, what part number, right? And um, that indicates a sort of lack or a paucity of information about helping the, the customer find what product is they need to purchase. Um, other things in information that can be high value uh, relate to technical support and training. Um, we've seen this a lot actually in the construction space that the, the training services are highly valued by the end customers and um, that's often an underappreciated fact by distributors until they get that voice of the customer. Still a third class of services are what we call value-added processing and there's again there's a variety of, of things here that can include everything from repairs to actually setting up uh, products, and you know that could be physical setup. Um, if it involves software, there might be software setup, um, fabrication, reconditioning, programming. There's a lot of opportunities here. Just as a comment, Ian, in his preparations for his many uh, keynote um, presentations, has made a habit of gathering a list of services. So for example, he gathered services prior to
you tell me, and it was it was a subset, right? Oh yeah, no, I mean there are many more. I just you know wanted to pick some common ones that I saw across various distributors. Yeah, and so this phenomena of you know there was well seventy in 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 electrical with a lot of effort. You found another hundred and twenty in the power transmission space. Um, when we when we look at the significant range of services, and then we look at the actual number of services that most distributors have, it indicates that there's a, there's an opportunity to grow the set of services that are offered. Ian, thoughts on the sort of categorization here, or or what it means for our audience? Yeah, I think you know logistics is about uh, supply chain related stuff, so moving the inventory around and and. Information is, you know, data, advice, et cetera, and value-added processing is really, you know, uh, hands-on the product. And, you know, what I like about these services, and I think this is important, is marketplaces are not likely to offer these. I mean, if you look at mark how the, you know, the, the economics of a marketplace, they make money by not having any people involved in the value delivery. I mean, it's one of the reasons they love these third-party sellers because, I mean, you know, when Amazon Business sells SKUs from a third-party seller, they have essentially zero variable cost, right? I mean, once those SKUs are built into the system, the software is settling the transaction uh, and the third party seller is doing all the picking and the packing and the shipping and it's their working capital that they're picking out of and their capital that built the warehouse and bought the forklift, right? So that is a really uh, inexpensive transaction for Amazon business and as their sales go up, they're continuing to get increasingly profitable on a percentage basis off of a fixed cost base because their variable costs aren't, aren't there. Um, and so the good thing about competing with companies like that is they tend to be very disciplined strategic planners. And that means they're making very deliberate decisions about what they're going to do, which means they're also making very deliberate decisions about what they're not going to do. And if Amazon business is not going to put hands on merchandise and offer services that require people, then that means as a distributor, You've just identified the white space where you can grow your business, avoid these behemoths who are taking up share. And that means you put in a lot of value added services. Uh, and, you know, they, those outfits really take it to an extreme. I mean, a lot of us go to conferences and very often the speaker asks the question, you know, how many of you have on Prime account? And everybody raises their hands. But I ask a different question. I ask the audience, how many of you have ever telephoned Amazon to place an order? And nobody raises their hands because you can't do that. And yet that's a very fundamental, basic, everyday service for a distributor. So if they can't even take phone calls, then imagine how you can keep customer loyalty if you do, you know, services like kidding and labeling and rentals and repair, you know, configuration, et cetera. Uh, so I think it's really essential. I mean, look, there's probably going to be some kind of a shakeout in distribution. You know, right now you've got all these huge companies that are, you know, some of the largest, most well-capitalized firms in the world moving into the distribution. Uh, and so I think it's very much a case where the swift are going to thrive and the slow are going to die. And so if, if you're swift, you need to figure out value added services in, in my opinion. Well, I think building on that point, Ian, um, so, so Amazon is, is, you know, sort of the, the biggest, of the 800 or 8,000 pound gorillas, but more broadly, a way that mid-market and smaller distributors can compete against larger distributors is going to be on services, right? Right. Um, and that's a, that's a big opportunity. So, so the largest distributors they can compete on product selection. In fact, they can typically make that claim as part of their their value proposition. Whereas the smaller distributors, um, not so much. But where they can be swift or nimble, to your point, is in is in the the intelligent selection um, and development of services that that customers care about. Related to that, I would say that um, some of the logistics stuff, some of the logistics services or value added services are are actually very crowded. There's there's a lot of competition. So, how many of your competitors are doing something related to vending or VMI? Um, answer is a lot. Um, I, th I think we're the for for the sectors that permit it, where there is more opportunity, is going to be on the information uh, related services and the value added processing services. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. And so uh, you and I had an interesting little competition this week. Uh, do you want to describe it? 
Yeah, we wanted to see, um, we, we wanted to come up with really good examples of um, communication of services through a web page of different distributors. Um, and so what Ian and I agreed was we would each pick a couple of distributors and um, share those and, and maybe just critique and, and actually see if there is a best one among them. They're all very good, so it, it may be hard to, to come up with the best. But I think we can, we can start to see some of the things that are interesting in the presentation, um, the thoughtful presentation of services to the market. Yeah, so let's go with through yours first, shall we? You bet. So this is kind of a, a low-hanging fruit one. Um, Fastenal is, is really good at a lot of things, right? Um, if, you're, if you're competing against Fastenal, you know that they are a formidable competitor. They are thoughtful about um, the product lines that they take on, the segments that they, that they take on, um, actually the, even the selection of competitors. Um, they've done a similar thing with services, and um, what, what I like or what I, what I would note about it is that it's, it's a very comprehensive offering. So um, at the top of this page, you see the supply solutions, uh, the vending, uh, bin tools, et cetera. Um, and that's, that's more of the table stakes offering. Uh, but then you get into the expert consultants offerings um, and you see things related to engineering and expertise. They still have still other services related to manufacturing, um, things related to industrial things, and then things related to compliance and sourcing. So it's, um, it's a very well thought through, well organized uh, group of services, and I would say very comprehensive, which you might expect from a, from a market leader. Hey, and Jonathan, if you click on these, you get to another level with uh, explanations of each individual service, right? Correct. Okay. Yes. Is there a way to, can you, um, do you know if you can transact any of these services? I guess I, I could have looked, but uh, can you transact any of these services online or is there a, a special contact number or email address on some of these? These are not transaction oriented. It, it is an email or you know, call for to get the service. Yeah. Um, but I, I like where you're going with this, which is that the provisioning or the procurement of services, especially in the COVID and post-COVID era, is going to need to start to shift to online. I don't know if that's where you're going with it. Yeah, I think, you know, you can't do it all online. And frankly, you know, the ones that you can do online may be the most differentiating, right? I mean, the, if, if your business is entirely digital, then you're more in the side for Amazon than if you have things that you do that require offline work. Um, and so, you know, but uh, yeah, it's a very impressive list. Um, and uh, it'd be interesting to click through and look at these individually. But I think you know, what, what they've accomplished here is something that a lot of other distributors should do, which is you know, gather up these services, put them under a tab, write detailed descriptions, and put them on the web in a compelling way. And they've certainly accomplished that uh, very impressively. I, I think there's one other piece here that's, that's noteworthy. It's the distinction between services that affect the core operation or COGS or the line function, whatever you want to call it, versus things that affect SGNA or a staff function. So if you look at these, just in the industrial services, you look at the lifting and rigging inspection, calibration and repair, hoist repair and certification. Those are just examples. Uh, those are all affecting line functions. And I think in, in sort of related to my comment about the logistics stuff, um, I think there's more opportunity to add value, at least in certain sectors, on value-added services that touch line functions, that touch, that touch COGS rather than touch SGNA. Yeah, that's interesting. So some of the stuff is sort of, you know, the MRO, you know, plant maintenance stuff, and some of it is really affecting the production line of a manufacturer, for example. Okay, you want to go to your next example? You bet. And... Um, sort of by way of apology to the audience, again, I took, you know, giganto players in the industry. It's like, wow, who, big surprise. Ferguson's got um, a good documentation on, on services as well. Well, we, we expect this much of Ferguson. I'm showing just a fraction here of the services that, that Ferguson offers. Um, they had three or four pages. There are very detailed descriptions 
Um, they cover different sectors of, of their business. So they, you know, they cover the, everything from HVAC to, to plumbing to, to, in many cases, the PVF world. Um, so they have them broken down that way. But again, one of the things that's, I think, compelling here is their emphasis on things that touch the line function of the core business. Um, so they, they mentioned the delivery and logistics, but if you look at the rest of the stuff on this page, um, it is about functions of the core business that are going to make the contractor either more efficient uh, and or more effective at what they do. Um, and I think that's really a key point as we think about services differentiation. To what extent are you making your customer more efficient, meaning um, lowering cost versus better, meaning um, producing a better result, which in some way is going to um, create greater customer satisfaction. Um, so all of their, all of their documentation uh, really points to the efficiency and the effectiveness of their services um, on the business of the contractor in this case. It's primarily contractors they're selling to. Yeah, it, uh, we have a question uh, from an old friend of mine, actually. It says that it'd be great to see a little guy best practice. So uh, we're going to move on to my examples. And I did look, uh, I wouldn't know that, I wouldn't say these are small companies, but they're uh, probably quite a bit smaller, definitely quite a bit smaller than the two, two that we've looked at. Um, so you ready to move on to those, Jonathan? Let's go for it. Okay. So uh, I, the, cho the two I chose, first of all, I chose Blackhawk. Now, uh, Blackhawk is, uh, you know, they're not small, but they're, they're, they're very well run. In fact, the CEO is a guy named John Mark, who I knew at HD Supply. In fact, when I first got to HD Supply, he probably, uh, uh, among the corporate people, was more helpful than anybody. He's, he's just a first-class guy. He, he really took me under his wing and showed me a lot about how the company worked. So no surprise that he's doing a great job running a company as a CEO. Um, but, you know, you, if you look at their, they really have a services tab, first of all, and they've got some very impressive services listed under there. So I explored their website for quite a while. And as you can see, the variety of services is impressive. I mean, it, and it's really stuff that requires hands on. I mean, it's very unlikely that any of the marketplaces are going to do, you know, just about any of this stuff, except perhaps vending. I've been predicting for a while that Amazon business will eventually get into vending because I think that's the B2B equivalent of the, you know, inside your foyer delivery that they're doing in retail or inside your trunk delivery that they're doing in retail. Uh, but so far they've defied me and have not done that yet. So, uh, you know, hopefully they won't. Uh, but they have a very impressive list of serv services and, you know, they, they uh, if you get into it, they've got very, very detailed information. Now, that Cribmaster brochure, I don't know if Blackhawk put that together or Cribmaster did, but it's a 12 page PDF that goes into as much depth as you wanna read about in terms of uh, vending solutions. Um, and they, I pulled out this one tool fab, but they'll actually make tools for your application. So, I mean, this is, you know, to me, the very definition of a very highly value added uh, distributor in terms of offering services and, you know, I don't know really much about this company and we don't have a, any kind of financial arrangement with any of these businesses, by the way. Um, but I would guess that their attrition uh, for accounts of any significance is very, very low because, I mean, they're right in the middle of what you identified as sort of the production processes for their customers in many cases. So I thought it was very impressive. Yeah, just as a comment, by the way, Cribmaster does great support for their distributors in terms of the collateral. We've seen this in a few of the other uh, distributors that we've worked with who are, who are selling Cribmaster. So. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, good for them. It's impressive. I'd not run across it. Uh, but they have a whole bunch of resources like that on their website. So, I mean, if you go to Blackhawk and you're on their website, you know, for even a few minutes, you're going to come away knowing that they don't just sell product. They, they have a lot of services. And it was impressive to me because I've looked at so many websites that have no services listed or they're, you know, buried, they're so buried in the website and, and not standardized in their presentation that you don't come away with an impression that's very important to the distributor. Um, oh, and by the way, I saw this piece, which I think was probably done by their marketing department. And I, I was like, holy cow, I don't know if I ever put together a marketing piece this good in my decades <laughs> as a marketing VP. But, you know, it, it, it's really cool how they show uh, a, a system and where the components go. And of course, you know, they sell all that stuff. Uh, but then they have, you know, a page of 
you know, pump repairs and fabrications and assembly and parts and service and manufacturing. I mean, it was very impressive. And I know, you know, if I was a account manager for Blackhawk, this is the kind of rich materi material that I could go hand to my customers that, you know, would really be differentiating from most of the MRO distributors that we know, right? I mean, most of them don't do this. And my guess is even if your competitors do it, they probably aren't presenting it as thoughtfully. Uh, so, you know, it was, it was, it, I was pretty impressed. Um, and so I want to go on to the next slide. We're going to, we have a, we have a question. I'm going to come back to it in just a minute. Um, and, uh, this is Radwell, uh, who is a power transmission slash electrical distributor. I think they're in New Jersey. Um, and they also had a very impressive layout of their services. I really liked the way they presented them. And they, had, they actually had a video. And I love this video because it was very, very well produced, but it, either they were not actors on the video or they were actors that really sounded and acted exactly like articulate smart employees because they weren't over polished, you know, I mean, they're very good and articulate, uh, but they walk through what happens when you return a product for repair. And it's two minutes and 19 seconds. Uh, and this young woman talks to, the, I don't I, like the receiving supervisor and the person who's in charge of repairs for whatever it was. And it was, it was, I mean, you felt like, oh my gosh, if I do a return here to get some important component repaired, it's in good hands because I actually had visibility behind the scenes. So I thought that was just very impressive. And then they have, some of their services are, you know, really uh, talked about in, I think, ways that are important to customers, you know, field repair and troubleshooting and um, sell your new or surplus to us. So they're offering to buy stuff back, which I, I don't think I've ever seen. Um, and then I was intrigued by cost savings report. So I clicked on that um, and they had a, uh, an example of this cost savings report here on the right. Um, and, you know, it's just an example, but you can actually get your cost savings report for your account uh, from them and it tells you, you know, how much money have you saved in product and services, et cetera, uh, and, and repair bills. It was, and I don't know what's behind it or how compelling it is if you see it as a customer, because I don't really know this company. I just came across their website, but you know, if, there, if there's meat behind this, holy cow, what a differentiator. And then it'd be really hard for a competitor to uh, talk their way into this, into an account. Um, if this stuff has the teeth that it looks like it has on their website. Um, and then I also have a screenshot of what was behind their field engineering uh, repair and calibration. And each one of these is a separate link where you can go in uh, and get additional information. So it was, it's pretty cool. They'll actually do customized training, et cetera. So this is another distributor that I think, I mean, I don't think they're gigantic, uh, but they do a really nice job having thought through their service menu. So I, I thought it was very impressive. One of the things that's important in this, and we'll talk about it a little bit more in a, in a couple of slides, but you, what, you're, what you've got on this slide, Ian, is yeah. how they are communicating quantitatively the value that they're delivering to, delivering to you. Uh, yeah. We've seen a number of initiatives, successful by the way, of documented cost savings where distributors will go and measure, they're not measuring it for the long tail customer, but they're measuring it for their larger customers what they're providing for them in, in cost savings. And they'll measure it on a, and report on it on a quarterly or monthly basis in some cases. Um, now, a lot of the documented cost savings tends, that I've seen, tends to have a, we're doing more customized services and we're documenting those cost savings. So I would, I would separate the documented cost savings from this particular thing, which is about, which is specific to the services that they have. And I think it's, I think it's really important to make sure you are communicating value. It could be that you're communicating value um, and you're actually not charging for it. It might show up on an invoice, this much value delivered. You're, you're letting them know, hey, look, we delivered this much value to you. Or it could be, yeah, we're communicating this value and we are monetizing it in some meaningful way. Yeah, I mean, I, look, there's, a, there's this evolution that you have to make from you know, sort of this haphazard set of services to an organized P&L driven effort uh, that makes a real difference in your customers' lives. And it's such an important part of their work lives that they uh, not only become stickier, but you have uh, enough transaction data that you can prove that you're saving them money and that you're making money on these services. So I think it's 
you know, you got to get started though. And just, you know, getting your services tab on your the homepage of your website and putting some thoughtful copy and thinking behind how you organize your services. What a great start. You know, I mean, it, it's kind of like the old, you know, you don't, you can't manage what you don't measure. Well, you know, if you're not, um, you can't measure what you don't manage, which one is it? You can't. You had it right the first time. Okay. Got it. Right. So you, you've got to, you, you've got to, uh, you've got to get these things organized so that you can put some measurement behind them. Um, and so the question we had was, um, and hello, Phil, might smaller distributors align with smaller manufacturers and contract expertise, engineering services, and so on. And I think that is a really important point to make that a lot of distributors, uh, and we're going to get to this notion of collaborating versus competing with your suppliers in a moment. But I, I do think that you know, manufacturers have a wide array of services that distributors don't typically look to them for, you know, they kind of see the manufacturer as the provider of product, not so much the provider of services. So just like you can pass product through, you can also pass services through. But I would say, you know, doing an audit of all your suppliers available services and seeing which ones you could bring through is a great suggestion. So thanks very much for that question. So, so part of um, what, what Ian and I think is really important is to start to treat services from a strategic standpoint, to not treat it as ad hoc, to not treat it as an afterthought. Um, to be clear, there are more, much more elaborate um, service management um, processes and, and methodologies for, for doing this. But I think the, the, the directional thing to impart here is that services really should be managed the way a good product manager would manage products. And if you look at the different levels of sort of authority or, or responsibility that product managers have, some, some product managers, I would call them heavy product managers, not a, that's not a reference to their weight, it's a reference to their authority and responsibility. They actually have um, revenue responsibility and even almost approaching P&L responsibility um, as you move into manufacturing settings um, product managers may have actually P&L uh, responsibility. So the idea is um, services should be treated in a similar manner. And um, as we've said, there are literally dozens or potentially hundreds of services that you could consider. When we look at most distributors, not the four that we've highlighted here, when we look at most distributors, they've got six or seven or eight services. And a lot of them have an ad hoc flavor. They're unaware, they, they know they're getting a lot of uh, sort of traction with a certain service, but they don't know the value or they don't know the cost of it. Um, so our view is that it's, it's important to take really a thoughtful look at the broader world of services. It, you know, if we're, we're treating this like a business plan, what are the, what are the set of services we could consider? Um, and then in, in evaluating the set of services, there's, there's two perspectives that are key to get. First is, what's the voice of the customer? Uh, does the customer care about this service? Uh, and then the second is, how, how competitive is it? You know, if I'm looking at doing VMI, I'm pretty confident that I'm going to be able to look around um, my local, regional, and national competitors that they're doing VMI. How well are they doing it? Or is, is there something that I'm doing that's, that's above and beyond what they're doing, and can I communicate that to, to the end market? So, so really um, coming up with a set of services that you're contemplating, getting feedback from the customer um, about the value of the service, um, and this can be done both quantitatively, or as I say it should be done both quantitatively and qualitatively, meaning with surveys and with interviews or focus groups, um, as well as um, understanding the, the competitive angle. As Ian mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, um, the understanding of value and cost is very limited for, uh, for most distributors of these services. Some of them, as uh, the last one that Ian showed, is, is conveying the value that they're delivering. Uh, but the vast majority of distributors don't have an understanding of the economic impact. If you are saving them money, if you're, if you're doing a cost savings type of a thing, an efficiency play, is it labor savings that you're doing? Is it material savings? Is it rework savings? There's all kinds of potential savings. And I think it's imperative, and I've, we've done this in, um, in other environments to, to really quantify the economic value, even if it's imprecise. If you're within plus or minus 
that's much more precise than what you had before you went through the exercise of understanding the economic value. Um, in a related vein, it's critical to understand the cost to deliver e-service. Um, now, one thing is, as you start to move down this path, you're going to find out which services um, that you have you can charge for and which ones you can't. It's likely that your current services as currently packaged, you're not going to be able to charge for. Um, you may need to do something different with them in terms of what's being offered. Uh, there might be a, a model that is, yeah, this gets included, but if you want this level of service, we're charging for it. Um, so you have to think about, you know, whether and how the services that you have are going to be part of something that you monetize. Hey, the yeah, other John. piece of it is, go ahead, Ian. Yeah, uh, so I think, you know, a couple thoughts. Um, you know, one is that if you estimate the cost to deliver the service today, you probably should do what your actual costs are and what your pro forma costs would be once you do it right, right? Because you could probably take costs out of these and deliver them more efficiently. So you might price for your future costs and then bring your costs down over time because you're already incurring the cost uh, and you're, you're probably losing money on it anyway. So why not, you know, redo the process, apply some Six Sigma, Six Sigma tools or something and get the get the cost down and at least put some measurements in place. But if you price based on your cost today, you might be over the market. Um, and then, you know, the other thing is the industry has a bad habit, right? And so it's going to take a while to get a significant percentage of distributors to start charging for services. So your ability to charge for services is some degree constrained by when your competitors give it away, which I think speaks to your point that you may have to do something extra. You may have to do the service better, measurably better, than your competitors, not just take a free service today and start charging for it, because customers aren't going to accept that, particularly if they get it for free from a competitor. A absolutely, and I, I think re related to that, um, they may, may they may need to actually choose a different set of services. We had a question about what about services for the little guy, uh, meaning the smaller distributor, not Fastenal, not Ferguson. Um, so the, the smaller distributors are probably not going to be able to offer the wide array of services of the larger companies. That being said, if you, if you look at some of these elements in this, in this checklist, really carefully selecting from the dozens of services you could do and then really carefully evaluating those from the customer competitive standpoint, you might be able to find the right set of eight or ten services that's way better than um, you, you know, the other 50 or 60 services that you might have done for your particular customer base or segment. I, I think another thing to, to consider um, is, you know, what if everybody were to offer services? There's a, there's a cute t-shirt that's gone around, like, surely not everybody is kung fu fighting, right? Um, and so what would happen if everybody were to offer services? Ian, thoughts? Well, I think, you know, as co competition begins to heat up for these smaller transactions out of marketplaces and more distributors do services, uh, it is going to heat up the competition for them. And like I said, I still think there's going to be some consolidation in the industry. Uh, but I think the sooner you get started on these services, the better you're going to be at them and the more likely you're going to be the one that customers pick as their long-term distributor uh, for these services. So yeah, I agree. I mean, you know, the competition's going to heat up um, and uh, so the sooner you get started, the better. Um, and we did have a comment here, a very helpful comment. Uh, and, and here it is, let's see, quick comment on ROI. A starting point is the most important thing as long as you can identify the input. So just get started with ROI. Um, and this actually allows for a customer conversation based on the input. So you can start talking to your customer about your costs uh, and the inputs that are going into this service and it can help personalize the return on investment. Plus you learn as we go. Um, and uh, we can also look at services as part of the overall experience. In other words, expectations that move beyond the equipment itself. I really like that. That's a really smart comment from someone who obviously knows how to do this because you know, you've got to engage the customer in this dialogue and talk to them about your costs and talk to them about the value that you're delivering so they don't take it for granted and also so that you can start to move to a point where you're discussing how you share the cost and revenue around this service. And 
it means the customer looks at you as more than a product supplier. So thanks very much, um, uh, Matt, for that comment. Really appreciate it. Go ahead, Jonathan. I think a final piece of this is, is how you do messaging. Uh, curiously, I got an email from one of our clients today um, that is just right on point. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read, um, it says, have you had your steam system checkup this year? We can help. Uh, the engineered products division of Z Corp can customize steam traps and gauges to meet your system requirements. And they list their different app, uh, expertise. They list surveys, steam traps, survey steam trap audits. Um, and they talk about um, rebates available from the gas company, save steam and save money. This is awesome. So this came in an email to me, and you know we're, we're big fans of, of outbound marketing automation, and we, we tend to emphasize the, um, the sort of product-oriented part of outbound marketing. But there's no reason you can't be using outbound marketing once you've got clear messaging for your services um, to, to get those services out there. An underlying belief in all this, um, and perhaps I'm being Captain Obvious here, is that, that services are going to differentiate, as, as Ian said, but they're also going to be sticky. They're going to be the things that help you keep that revenue that you're getting from, from other products as well. Ian, any thoughts on, on messaging around services? Well, I think we've shown some good examples today of how to do it right. Um, and I think the, the it's funny because when I go to these audiences uh, and I talk about services, I'll also ask a question. How, how many of you have gone to most or all of your competitors' websites and done an inventory of all the services that they offer? And I bet you the percentage of people who put up their hands is 2%, right? I mean, nobody has done this. And yet this is free competitive information that's out there. I mean, your competitors are sharing it. You don't have to like go look it up in a 10K or do any mystery shopping. It's right on their websites. And I, and I, I say, well, look, I mean, to get started in services, look at how your customers are, excuse me, how your competitors are talking about them. Go visit their websites, uh, you know, save the links, do an, an inventory of the services that are being offered, look at how they're talking about them, and then use that as a starting point to figure out what services you want to offer and use that to learn how to talk about services. And so I, I just think that's, that, that stuff is, is free information that's out there today. And by the way, I found some really interesting service, services when I was in, uh, speaking in Europe. I've done that a couple of times now. And you know, there's some distributors over there that are, that are very good. There's some great distributors in Australia. Uh, so you, know, you can look around the, the world at some of these services and you know, really learn a lot. And with Google, we'll translate a lot of these websites. So that's helpful too. Um, and you don't have to look exactly in your industry. I mean, you can look at allied industries because things like, you know, bin replenishment uh, and a lot of other services happen all over, across all these different verticals. So I would say, you know, the, my guess is that if you're writing your copy from scratch without at least understanding how other people are talking, I'm not condoning plagiarism. I'm saying, you know, at least learn, look it up to feel, you know, to get the tone and rewrite it in your own words uh, that can be a helpful way to get started with your marketing messaging. Good. Look, let's look at the next slide, uh, which is a, there's another useful perspective and perhaps a cautionary tale. Um, I think many of us are familiar with the concepts of forward and backward integration, um, but just simply, if you're a distributor, forward integration means starting to take on, starting to do some of the functions. Um, if it's a, construction thing that the contractor does, if it's a manufacturing setting that the customer does. Um, backward integration is where you start to do a function of somebody upstream from you, in this case, manufacturing. As it pertains to services, really the question is more about forward integration. And really, we, you need to think about to what extent am I, am I threatening or am I benefiting an intermediary customer or contractor? We spoke to a very, very uh, well-run HVAC distributor, and the quote that they shared with us, uh, it was for a large construction project. They said, you know, we've got more people on the rooftop than the contractor, and they were talking about the set of services that they were doing. And clearly, they had thought through, you know, we're doing something that might be a little bit threatening to our intermediary customer, um, but they, they understood the rationale for it, and they, they decided to proceed with that. 
um, through all of this, you have to think about that impact. Um, is, it, is it supportive to your intermediary customer uh, or end customer? Um, or is it in some way threatening? And then also, uh, as Ian said before, you know, manufacturers have, product, have, have services that they want you to, to take on. So if you're starting to take on some of those services, it may be benefiting a supplier. Yeah, very good. I think you know it's, these are these are important ways to think about services because if you move uh, forward in the channel and you threaten one class of your customer base, you could do more harm than good. I think that's a question you have to ask yourself as you provide these services. Am I taking you know taking a load off of my customer in a way that is just helpful to them, or am I in the process threatening another type of customer that I have, or do I my, Am I doing something the manufacturer feels that they own? And I'm not saying you should ever do any of those things. I mean, you know, certainly that HVAC distributor we talked to was fully aware that they were moving into stuff that would normally be considered contractor work, and they just felt like it was worth the risk, um, and it appeared to work out for them. So, you know, I'm not saying you would never do that, but I think you should be careful. All right, so that uh, that's really the end. Do you want to have any, uh, any wrap-up comments, Jonathan? I think just stating again the, the, the importance of being thoughtful about services, there's a big opportunity here. Not everybody's going to, to move into services. A lot of companies are going to do services that are commoditized or that uh, a lot of other distributors are doing. So um, there's, a, there's a big calling, I would, I would say a clarion call, um, given some of the dynamics that Ian pointed out at the beginning of our podcast today to to really be thoughtful, to choose the right set of services, uh, to communicate them, to understand value, and to make them into uh, a profit setter. Yeah, uh, so we have another uh, comment uh, from the same person who provided some of the other valuable comments. It says, you want to explore these integration topics during piloting and design with a small sample. So I think he's talking about whether you're integrating uh, forward or backwards, you want to make sure you're during pilot and design, you're you know, talking about this stuff and doing a small sample and you'll learn how to focus on the right jobs in a non-threatening way and how to uh, create trust. So another, thank you so much, Matt, another very valuable comment. Uh, so if you wanna reach us on the web, you can find us at distributionstrategy.com. Thank you so much for attending our webinar today. Uh, Jonathan, it was, as always, it was great presenting to you or with you, excuse me. Uh, and I hope everyone has a wonderful day in the exciting world of distribution. Thank you.